Well, thank you, Ted, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. This, isn't this conference been fantastic the last few days? I'd like to uh, welcome you all to this lunch, and on behalf of uh, our CEO, Roger Ferguson, who you saw in the, the film just a moment ago, and all of the TIA employees uh, who are here with us today, we're really pleased to be hosting this plenary lunch and with our long-term partner, the American Council on Education. Uh, as Ted and so many others have uh, indicated the last couple of days, 2018 is a big year for ACE and for TIAA. We're both celebrating our centennials. TIAA is also proud to, as we've noted, celebrate the 20th anniversary of, of the uh, TIAA Institute, as you saw in the video. Uh, but I just think it's kind of remarkable uh, these two great organizations working together in support of all of you for literally the last century. It's, uh, it doesn't happen that often uh, in the world we live in to have organizations that are that long standing and have worked so collaboratively together for that kind of period of time. So on behalf of everyone at, at TIAA, who I'd like to stand up to honor ACA and say happy 100th anniversary to all of our friends at ACE. We thank you at ACE for all the amazing contributions to higher education that you've made and can't wait to see what lies ahead in the next 100 years. Secondly, I'd like to thank really all of you. Uh, you are leading as leaders in higher education through a period of dramatic change in our country. But your collective leadership has really never been more important than this moment in time. You will help shepherd higher ed ahead and unlock the potential of future generations in our society. Uh, and that is, there, there can be no higher goal than that. So thanks for everything that you do to make that happen. We uh, do a lot together with ACE and the Institute uh, together uh, we share critical research about critical issues and challenges and opportunities that you face in the higher ed world. And another vital aspect of TIA's partnership with ACE is the annual Theodore H. Hesburgh Award for Leadership Excellence in Higher Education. And that's really why we're here today and at this moment. I'd like to ask all prior Hesburgh Award winners in the room to stand. I know we have a few of them here because Freeman Abrowski is right in front of me. I think Diana Natalicio, I think, is somewhere out there. Congratulations, everybody. <clears throat> this, uh, this award is in honor of the late Reverend Theodore Hesburgh who, as Ted indicated, one of really the most influential figures in modern history of, of education. For 28 years, uh, as, Fred, as uh, Ted indicated, he also served on the TIA Board of Overseers. Father Hesburgh once said that vision is what leadership is all about. That quote not only sums up Father Hesburgh's view of leadership, but it's also a perfect prelude to this year's Hesburg Award winner. Because if there's one word that sums up what makes our honoree this year so extraordinary, it is his remarkable and groundbreaking vision. Dr. Paul LeBlanc of Southern New Hampshire University is a true pioneer in higher education, a leader who is revolutionizing the modern university model and creating outstanding new opportunities for students here in the United States and around the world. Throughout his career, Paul has led the way in championing new learning platforms, expanding access to quality education, and creating new pathways that allow students to overcome barriers and complete their degrees. As you saw from the walk-in presentation, Paul's achievements are really awe-inspiring. In his 14 years leading Southern New Hampshire, he's transformed the institution into the country's second largest nonprofit provider of online higher education. In doing so, he's helped Southern New Hampshire University increase the number of students it serves from 2,500 
to more than 80,000, and that is not a typo. <laughs> Many of whom come from underserved populations. As a result of Southern New Hampshire University's explosive growth, the university has also seen some other benefits, including a 12-fold increase in revenues. And Southern New Hampshire University continues to blaze new trails. Last year, the university announced plans to launch a major effort to bring university degrees to refugees in the United States and around the world, the first large-scale initiative of its kind. As Southern New Hampshire's goal is to educate 50,000 refugees in 20 locations by 2022. That's pretty amazing. In addition to his many powerful contributions to Southern New Hampshire University, Paul's also become a highly respected voice on national issues. He served as senior policy advisor to Under Secretary Ted Mitchell at the US Department of Education, working on competency-based education, new accreditation pathways, and innovation. Forbes magazine has listed Paul as one of its 15 classroom revolutionaries and one of the most influential people in higher ed today. Fast Company has named Southern New Hampshire University to its world's 50 most innovative companies list, the only university included. And Washington Monthly named Paul one of America's 10 most innovative university presidents. After all these accomplishments and accolades, Paul remains as committed to as ever to education and also as humble as one could possibly be to what he's achieved and to the life-changing difference that an education can make and that he's helping to deliver. Paul, what you have accomplished is truly incredible. Thank you for everything you do. You're an inspiration and a difference maker, and we couldn't be more honored and proud to be honoring you with the 2018 Theodore M. Hesburgh Award for Leadership Excellence. So please join me on stage, and please all of you join me in welcoming Paul. So I know um, you're probably thinking what I thought when Stephanie and Ann called me with this news, which is they've confused him with Tom LeBlanc over at George Washington, who's the president there. It's a different LeBlanc. Um, but they didn't find out their mistake, so I stand here before you. Uh, I'll, I'll say this, even though it's a little bit dangerous uh, in this city at this time, but I'm an immigrant. Um, And a first-generation college graduate, uh, first in my family to go to college. And I didn't speak English, which will become apparent to you, as my first language as a kid when we immigrated. And my uh, parents had eighth-grade educations, and my mom cleaned houses for wealthy people in the town of Weston, just outside Boston. And she used to plunk me in their libraries, which were beautiful, and I still can feel nostalgic about the smell of leather and wood. And she'd give me kids' books, and she would be vacuuming in the background and singing, as she always did when she cleaned. Uh, and I learned to read English. Um, and, you know, it is a version of the American dream. My, uh, my mom worked till she was 76 in a factory. My dad was a stonemason. And my two daughters have lives that are scarcely imaginable to them. Um, and they have that experience, that transformative experience, because I had access to affordable, high-quality education. So the American dream lived very closely. <laughs> So when I, uh, when I got the news, I read all of Father Hesburgh's essays uh, in preparation for today, and I was both inspired and a little depressed that the fights he had to fight, and he fought so well, 
are the fights we still fight today. We announced last week that we have, um, with, with generous support, will launch an initiative to, launch, to uh, educate 1,000 DACA recipients across the country with our partners. And thank you. Um, and and we're, we're working with homeless kids and kids who have timed out of the foster care system in LA County. We're working in refugee camps. Uh, as Ron said, um, we just this week opened in Malawi and Kenya. Um, we're working with veterans. 15% of our online undergraduate students are veterans, many of them struggling with the unfair things we asked of them as we sent them on deployment after deployment. And in all of those cases, what I'm struck by is that fundamentally we're in the business of hope. Um, and I think our future hinges on whether we have ambitious, connected, socially connected, network savvy kids who have hope or who are hopeless because it's in their hopelessness that breeds the roots of the civil discontent and discord that we see in so many parts of the world. But when we give them education and the tools to better their lives, we are in the business of hope and we're in the business of making the future better. Theodore Hesburgh believed strongly that higher education was the engine of social mobility and also social justice. And, and that's what we do every day collectively. And I am honored to be with people like Gail and Freeman and my friend John Sexton, Patricia from Trinity. Um, they are in the business of hope every day. Um, for me, uh, the driver, the moral compass of that work are my two daughters and my wife. They have a fierce sense of social justice and very high BS meters. Um, and my wife is here, and one of my two daughters is here, the other bad child uh, is in New Zealand. But, um, <laughs> But if this work uh, can only um, make them a little bit proud of me on any given day, then uh, it feels like I've done my job. Uh, and, and I'm incredibly grateful for their support through all of this. Um, we often say that talent is, um, is universally distributed. In all of those places that I listed where we're working, in some cases pretty hopeless places, um, that gets reaffirmed all the time. But opportunity is not. And we need to find ways to reinvent higher education, holding on to all that is dear to us and knowing that it will always be varied and there will always be a place for the kinds of institutions we embrace and love, but that we also have to find new models and new ways to bring education to more people. I think the country has never needed us more than it needs us right now. So thank you very much for this. I am absolutely humbled um, to be before you. Thank you.